Our scripture comes from both Deuteronomy 6 and from the book of Ephesians. Deuteronomy 6, all scripture is God-breathed, all scripture is inspired, but there are certain parts of the Bible that really stand out, and this is a hallmark text in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, in it, you hear the Shema that the Hebrews would talk about, and it was for them, the Hebrew people, the most important scripture of all. Um, what I'd like, I'd like you to stand with me and let's read Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8 together. After that, then I'll read 20 through 25, and then I'll read Ephesians. But read with me Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 8. This is the word of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Okay, you may be seated. And it continues, uh, it continues in verse 20. And in verse 20, it says this. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord God has commanded you, tell him. We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh, and his whole household. But he brought us out from, from there to bring us to the land, bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey this law before the Lord our God as he commands us, that will be our righteousness. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 writes this, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you're not a God who remained quiet, but we thank you that you're a God who has spoken. May we hear your voice. May, may we hear you speak to us. We know that in your word is life. May we hear you speak to us. Through Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Sometimes people talk about the difference and even the conflict between things that are urgent and things that are important. Say, for example, that, that um, say that you're driving along and you blow a tire. I recently had done that. I hadn't done that in years and years. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but it's great. So um, <laughs> years ago, I, well, Connie and I were driving along, and then the car started to go thump, thump. What, what is that? Thump, thump, thump. Okay, so I pull off the road, and my tire, you know, this is a seminary car, you know? It, 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 seminary cars are not very good for most of us, at least back then. And it had a bulge in this tire. And me being the brilliant mechanic I am, knew that that was not good to have a bulge in your tire. And so I, I found a place, pulled off the road, and, and took the lug nuts off, and I could not get that tire off. I could not. It just those old rusted car, I couldn't get the tire off. And so um, I walked uh, down the road. There was a house not too far away, and so I walked down there, and there was a guy there, and he had arms like, this is big round. Yeah, I, I, I just mean these massive arms. And uh, I said to him, I told him what was the wrong. 
And I don't remember the man saying a word. I don't. But he walked over to his garage, grabbed a sledgehammer, walked out with me, gave it one royal crack, and turned around and walked away. <laughs> he fixed it. The second blown tire I had was when we were going through New York. It wasn't a Michigan pothole. It was a New York pothole, and it was deep. And as soon as I hit it, Connie says, you're going to break the tire. I said, we did break the tire. We did. <laughs> but when you blow a tire like that, it's an urgent thing. You just can't go anywhere. You, you can have a full day planned. You can have all sorts of things going on for the day. But when that tire is blown, you've got to stop. You've got to fix it. Now, let's say that maybe you, you were headed to uh, the mechanic shop and you were getting, getting oil change and you blew a tire. The urgent thing is you have to get that tire fixed, but you have to remember the important thing, still go get your oil changed because if you don't change the oil, bad things are going to happen to the engine. The one is urgent, the other is important. There are a lot of things in life, in life like that, urgent and important. And sometimes it seems that the urgent things crowd out the important things. Some of you have been to the emergency room. Some of you have gone to the emergency room. When you've been at the emergency room, some of you have waited and waited and waited. Got a prayer for you for those occasions. Thank you, Lord, that I'm waiting because that means that I am much less severely ill than these people who are being rushed in before me. I remember that. It's a terrible thing to wait in the waiting room, I know. Urgent and important. We have them both in life. And the thing you have to be careful with is that the urgent does not crowd out the important things of life. Okay? Be careful. The urgent things of life, and not just the urgent things, but also the busyness of life, can crowd out what matters most. Be careful. Don't let urgency, don't let the busyness of life crowd out the most important things in life. Well, what's most important in life? What's, what matters most? And you heard it in the Torah, and we read it together. We're told by God himself... We're told these words, love the Lord your God with your heart, with your soul, and with all your strength. And then there were these people listening to Jesus. They're listening to Jesus, this rabbi. They didn't know where he got his education. They didn't know where he got all this understanding. They didn't know how he knew it, all of these things. But they said, you've given some pretty good answers, Jesus. What's most important? And Jesus didn't teach them something different than the Torah, but he comes back to the Torah. He comes back to that word of God, and he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind. That's the most important thing. Love God. And then something very close to it is love people. And the whole law, everything, depends on that. Love God. I want to ask two questions this morning. And the one we're going to deal with just briefly, and then the second one we're going to deal with a little bit longer. I want you to know that because it's a two-part sermon, and the one part is going to be shorter than the second part. So the first part is this. How? How do we do that? How do we love God? Now, the easiest thing to do when you want to figure out something like this is just to make a list. I'd like to give you a list and say, here's your list. This is how you, you love God and, and do a list. And, and for those of you who are married, uh, you know, how do you love your wife? Well, I got my list. You know? Um, Four times a year, I'm supposed to buy flowers. So four times a year, I buy flowers. Um, uh, 100 nights a year, I give her the remote, and I don't watch the shows I want to watch. Um, you know, you go down the list. 
I know the things that she likes to do, and so once a month I make sure that we get to do something that she likes to do. I make a list. Now, that doesn't sound very romantic or anything, but you make a list. Now, part of me likes that idea, and, so, and part of me says that's a ridiculous idea. How, 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 do you, how do you know that you love your wife? Well, look at here. Look at my list. Look at my list. That kind of half works, doesn't it? There's something missing about that list thing. If you just go by the list, oh, yeah. But on the other hand, if I don't ever do the things on that list, then something else is wrong, right? If there's never anything on that list that I'm doing, something seems off. How do you know you love your wife? I fulfilled the list. That, that's not good enough. In the same way, kind of, how do you know you love God? How, how, are, how are we loving God? The easiest thing to do is come up with a list. You know, that's the easiest thing to do. Um, I know I love God because I, uh, I attend church and I worship. I know I love God because um, I give money away. I know I love God because I volunteer. Come up with a list. I love God because I pray. I want you to do all those things. Those are important things. God wants us to do those things. But somehow it doesn't just seem right, does it, to say, well, I know I love God because here's my list. Here's my list. But God does say something that shows how we love him, and it doesn't seem overly spiritual. It seems so basic, and you say, there's got to be more to it than that, isn't there? But what God says is, you obey me. Seems more complicated than that, doesn't it? But, but if you take a look at this, look at this. If, if your Bibles are open yet, if you look at Deuteronomy, back in chapter 4, it says, 4.1, Now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land of the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving to you. Listen, here are the decrees, obey them. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now, usually if you read the Ten Commandments, you, you read them in Exodus, but here they are again in the book of Deuteronomy. And so you see the Ten Commandments are in this chapter, but when it begins in verse 1, it says, Moses summoned all the people and said, Hear, Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. Obey them. And then we heard, we read together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, with all your strength. These commands I give you to be are, are to be on your hearts. How do you know that you love God? Well, Jesus put it this way. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We can, we can get off into very fuzzy areas and talk about what love is and you can get all kinds of places but biblically the Lord says if you love me you listen to my voice now I know that you can get very legalistic about it and say well I do this 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 and I don't do that that and that yeah you can, you can just make it all a list but I think you can look at it this way You can do something because it's the law. But you can do something because, well, put it this way. Let's say that, that you're 16 years old and, and you get to drive the family car. And so your mom or dad gives you the keys and says, you drive carefully. So you get out on the road and you read the sign. The sign says speed limit, let's say you're on the highway, 70 miles per hour. And you can say, because it's the law, I'll drive 70 miles an hour. I won't speed because it's the law. People are saying, oh yeah, really? Um, anyway, let's skip that. But maybe you're 16 years old, you've been given the keys, you're starting to drive, and you say, you know what, I'm not going to speed, not because it's the law, but because mom or dad 
are trusting me with a car, and I want to please them. There's a difference there, isn't there? It's because it's the law. No, no, it's because I, I love them. And that's what it's getting at here in the Bible. It's because we love God, that we strive not perfectly. There's no one here that does it all that perfectly. But, but we seek to do it because we love him. We seek to obey him. That's how. But then comes the question, why? Why? Why does it matter? Why do we have to love God at all? What, what, aren't there... Why? Why? Look at chapter 5 at verse 6 of Deuteronomy. As the Lord gives the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He's going to give them the law, and he says, I'm the God who has rescued Israel. You. And if you turn over into chapter 6, we've read this at verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments are to, are to, I give you today are to be on your hearts. And then when you drop down to verse 20, in the future... When your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord your God has commanded you, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh. You tell your son, you tell your daughter, tell him what God has done for you. We were slaves and he has rescued us. And that's why we're striving to follow him and to listen to him. Because of what he's done for us, we were slaves and now we're free. Now you come to the New Testament. Ephesians, we read this morning. If you go through the entire book of Ephesians, the first three chapters of Ephesians tell us about what God has done for us. And it says God has called us, God has chosen us, God has reached out to us, and God has saved us by his grace, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, so that no one can boast. God has saved us. And those first three chapters of Ephesians just emphasize that. Look at what God has done for us. He's rescued us, he's delivered us, he's saved us, he's been so good to us. And then chapter four says, now... Live worthy. And it shows us how to live that show, shows us how to live in such a way that it shows that we love God. And we'll talk a lot about a lot of areas of life. But one thing it talks about in that section is family life. It talks about family life. Part of loving God is loving the family. What's that look like? Well, well, he really says two things here. First, he has a word for children. Obey your parents. This is, comes as no surprise. It comes as no shock that the Bible says obey your parents. Lots of people throughout history, way before the Bible, would say obey your parents, for it's right. Do that. It's interesting that I can't say every catechism. A catechism, I know that's an intimidating word, but, but catechisms are just a, a, a way of teaching with questions and answers. That's a catechism. We ask a question, you give the answer. Our church has one. A lot of churches have catechisms. I looked at different catechisms to see how they explain this because almost all of them have the Ten Commandments in it. First one I looked at was Westminster Confession. It says, what is required in the Fifth Commandment? Listen to this. The fifth commandment requires the preserving, or preserving the honor and performing the duties belonging to everyone in their special places and relations as superiors, inferiors, or equals. I am so glad I'm not a Presbyterian because I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Be thankful today. Uh, I read the Lutheran Catechism. Listen to this. This is great. What does it mean? We should fear and love God. I love the way the Lutherans do that at the beginning. 
Why do, you, why do you obey your parents? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Why do you live the way you do? Because you, because you love God, and that's why you seek to live this out in your family life and obey your parents. Icing on the cake is the catechism we have. Heidelberg Catechism, watch this. What's God's will for you? That I honor, love, and be loyal to my father and mother and all those in authority over me. That I submit myself with proper obedience to their good teaching and discipline. And also, that I be patient with their failings. Listen to that. You didn't know what was in there. You didn't remember that. Over 400 years ago, in these families... There are families saying, why do we have to listen to mom and dad? They, they make mistakes. They make, uh, they're human. They, they mess things up. Absolutely. 450 years ago, the catechism was saying, your parents aren't perfect. They mess up. Of course they do. Be patient with them. It's remarkable. We thought that was just a new thing. It's not new at all. Do it, and that shows, in part, your love for God. So it's no surprise whatsoever that in the catechism that, that, that there's a section that says, obey your parents. It's no shock at all that in the scripture it says that. But what is shocking is that there's a word for parents, but it's especially a word for fathers. And it says, fathers... Do not exasperate your children. Back in the Apostle Paul's day and before that, the Romans were notoriously harsh fathers. Now, I'm sure they weren't always as harsh as the writings have it, but what the Romans said is, fathers, you can treat your kids any way you want. It's just appalling when you read the, some of the rules that they had that the ancient Roman fathers could carry out and the way they could treat their children, and it was okay. Terrible. You can read you a page, but uh, it, unbelievable. I don't think they did all those things, but they could. The Apostle Paul comes along and he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Do that. that that's one way that you show your love for God. I know they're not perfect, but obey them in the Lord. And parents, fathers, don't you be like those Roman fathers. Don't you, don't you exasperate your children. Don't you be hard-fisted. Don't you be too hard on them. But at the same time, bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Teach them the Lord's way. Do it. He's very deliberate about it. No, don't be harsh and overbearing, but at the same time, don't be a father that says, oh, it doesn't matter what you do. Don't be a father that says, anything goes, live however you want, I don't care. Don't be that. Teach them deliberately God's way. And implied in this whole circle, mothers and fathers and children, There's got to be grace. There's got to be forgiveness. Everybody messes up, but show the love of Jesus within your families. Now, as I finish up this morning, just one thing. I want to take a step back and see kind of a bigger picture. In a sense, everything that we're talking about here is live out your faith in family life. Live it out where you live. Live it out in your family relationships. It's the toughest place, perhaps, but live it out there. But there's something that, that's basic to this whole thing, and it's this. Family is God's idea. I've told you about this guy, uh, Bavink, I, I read a while back. Beautiful things. No other institution, whether through the efforts of particular individuals or societies, established through the church or through the state can replace or compensate for the family. The family is basic. The family is essential. The state can never take over or displace the family. And 
no matter how gloomy all of this may be, he's talking about the, the family in his day over 100 years ago. He says, look at what's happened to the family. No matter how gloomy all this may be, no matter the effort it may take to row against the current age, Christians may not permit their conduct to be determined by the spirit of the age, even if they stand alone. That's 110, 20 years ago he wrote that. And then he finishes this way. All good, enduring reformation begins with ourselves and takes its starting point in one's own life. If family life is indeed being threatened by all sides today, then there is nothing better for each person to be doing than immediately to begin reforming one's own circle. Start with yourself. So easy for us to look at everything going on in society and in the world, but he says, start with yourself. Mothers and fathers, start with yourself. Boys and girls, start with yourself. Pastor Matt, start with yourself. Start with yourself. (laughs) Amen. You know, have you ever done this? Um, this isn't part of the script either. Have you ever done this? That, that, that you know, my kids are older now, but you ever, you ever done this as a father that you, you, you kind of get upset and you say something or do something you shouldn't have done and, and, oh, and you turn red in the face and you get angry and, and everybody laughs at you and you know you have it coming? Humble ourselves before the Lord and may, may our love for God show in the way that we as children love our parents and honor them. May it show in the way that we who are parents respect our children, not exasperate them, but lead them in the way of the Lord. And what's the most important thing? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind. Love God. May we do it together as a church, and may all of our families seek to do it as well. And may God bless us as we do. Let's pray together. Lord, we know that we're far from perfect at this. Some of us who are fathers wish we were much better fathers. Some of us who are mothers wrestle with being the moms that you've called us to be. Some of us as children, we we wrestle because sometimes we just um, have a hard time with what our parents say. Lord, we pray that your spirit will keep speaking to us. And we pray that you'll keep working in our lives. Make us fully into the people you call us to be and and make our families places where your grace is seen, where your love is shown. And we seek, with the Spirit's help, to follow you. Be honored in us and through us today. In Jesus' name, amen.